Thank you very much, and what a pleasure to welcome a nice, fresh, keen young audience that we've got. <laughs> uh, welcome to the show. For those of you who've heard it or know the show, you'll recognise from our announcer that we have three of our regular players, Kenneth Williams, Derek Nomo and Peter Jones, and we welcome back, as I guess, someone who's played it with great success before, Martin Jarvis. And, uh, as always, I will ask them to speak, if they can, on the subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. This week, we'll begin the show with Derek Nimmo. Derek, the subject is a turn. Will you tell us something about that subject in just a minute, starting now? I think the turn we dread most in life is the upturn of the glass, which means that the sands are running out, death is approaching. And when that old man with the scythe comes over the horizon and you know that it is your turn, do you not begin to think of your garden, the life that you have lived on this earth? I know that I do, and Nicholas Parsons, who's nearly 60, continually <laughs> thinks about the turns that he has done to people. And perhaps when he was a Boy Scout, and I know that he was one, he did a good turn to everyone every day. Day, which is <laughs> Peter Jones a challenge. Uh, hesitation. Yes, I think so. Because yeah, I think um, every one and every day, and I suddenly realised there was one was joined. Uh, yes, wasn't. and of course wasn't this shame. continual emphasis that the, the public will begin to think I'm younger and younger every time you mention this approaching birthday, which is way in the distance. Um, Twenty seconds for you on a turn, Peter. Starting now. One of the meanings of the word turn also is having a nasty turn, which means you're kind of come over all peculiar and you've got the gym jams and that isn't at all pleasant. But these music hall vaudeville or variety turns... <laughs> well, when here Mr. Blows his whistle, it tells us that 60 seconds is up and Peter Jones was doing it and so he gained an extra point for doing so as well as the other point is round. He has a lead at the end of the first round, takes the second round and the subject, Peter, is mosquitoes. Will you tell us something about those in just a minute, starting now? I happen to be allergic to them, and when I am bitten, I blow up as though I've got elephantiasis or something. I remember once I was sleeping with my wife in the south of France, and I heard... <laughs> Terry never challenged. Has he only slept with his wife once? <laughs> Uh, my, my, my challenge is an, an unnatural marriage. <laughs> I think it's a delightful challenge, Derek, and we give you a bonus point for entertaining us all, and Peter gets a point for being interrupted, but keeps the subject of mosquitoes, and there are um, 54 seconds left starting now. I heard the telltale buzz of the female mosquito, and I turned the light on and saw this insect vertical on my wife's bare flesh. And I thwacked it as hard as I possibly could. She screamed, sat up, bolt upright in bed, and grabbed a bottle which handily was beside the bed. We usually have one there. And <laughs> was just about to crash it onto my skull when she recognized me. <laughs> and she paused and uh, hesitated and was about to go back to sleep again when she said, please... Uh, Martin Jarvis challenged. I think there was a repetition of pause and hesitate. I didn't say pause and hesitate before. No, you didn't say pause or hesitate before. He certainly paused. And he hesitated. And he certainly hesitated. But you didn't challenge for that, Martin. So I had to take the first thing, your worst challenge you give, which was for repetition. Oh, I think that's a bit unfair, don't you, everybody? No, I have to be fair within the game, because otherwise I'll have them all up my throat, and it's <laughs> difficult enough as it is. <clears throat> your first challenge was for repetition, and he didn't repeat himself. So he keeps the subject with nine seconds to go on mosquitoes, Peter, starting now. This was in the Camargue, which was riddled with these insects. And I remember by the time we'd left that uh, bedroom... Well, I'm going to enlighten Peter. You keep saying insects. You can say mosquito as many times as you like, because it's on the card, darling. <laughs> actually, well, that's very sweet of you, Jen. <laughs> yes, yeah, very nice. But actually, Kenneth, he didn't repeat it because he said musk. He said insects that time, and the time before he said insect. Oh, yes, right, 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 right. You're very good, Chairman. I, you're very good. Well, I have to listen to this. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm torn apart. I'm mangled by the hounds that play the game. Uh, there are two seconds with you, Peter. Still on mosquitoes, starting now. There were little messes all over the walls and ceiling. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, in spite of many interruptions and difficult decisions for the chairman, Peter managed to stagger on until the 60 seconds was up. I don't and... like that stagger. <laughs> well, I it... once did a tour abroad with Peggy Mount, and she bought a machine which gave out the noise of a pregnant mosquito, and the idea was it would keep them away. But in fact, it attracted all the male mosquitoes, and she was stung all over. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> There is a way of dealing with it. There's a little thing you plug into the wall and you put these little uh, treated cartons on top and actually it does keep the mosquitoes you away. You don't have many walls in the middle of the Sahara. <laughs> no, but uh, as you obviously go to the Sahara far more than everybody else, it'd be no use to you. Peter Jones, you kept going manfully Thank you for much, 60 sir. seconds <laughs> and got that extra point for speaking as the whistle went and including all the other points, you have a commanding lead at the end of that round. And Martin Jarvis and Kenneth Williams are training a little. Martin begins the next round. Martin, the subject is Sam Goldwyn. We've heard Kenneth talk about Hal Roach. Will you talk another, about another of the greats of the Hollywood era in 60 seconds, starting now? Sam Goldwyn was a great Hollywood producer, famous for his bon mots and the mistakes he made. He would say things like, What we want is a story that starts with an earthquake and works its way up to a climax. A verbal contract isn't worth the paper it's written on. Anyone who goes to a psychiatrist should have his head examined. Let's bring this movie up to date with a load of uh, 20th century dialogue. I was always an independent even when I had partners. Include me out. The picture makers will inherit the earth. He was actually, originally, a glove maker from Minxt. Peter Jones has challenged. Uh, hesitation. I know, a full stop, I think. Yes. I think he said all he had on uh, Sam Goldwyn, which I impressed us immeasurably, and then he ceased. So, Peter, you have him for hesitation, you have the subject, and you have 23 seconds starting now. After discussing for some time his early days in Hollywood, he was heard to remark, yes, we've all passed a lot of water since those days. <laughs> that was one of his more famous uh, Goldwynisms. Um, Kenneth Williams has challenged. Hesitation. Yes, I think so, Kenneth. So you have ten seconds on Sam Goldwyn starting now. He rang me up from Hollywood and said, come and rub your belly in the hot sand and I will make a new future for you. I said, hang on, I'm on night. What are you talking about? <laughs> so, Kenneth kept this going magnificently until the whistle went, gained an extra point. He's now in third place. Uh, Peter, Peter, snoring. Can you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? <clears throat> yes, well, I remember I was sleeping with my wife in the size of France. <laughs> <laughs> and I am inclined from time to, uh... <laughs> uh <laughs> sleeping with his wife is inclined to err. Uh. Oh, well. <laughs> but you got in, Martin, and there are 52 seconds on snoring with you starting now. Snoring is a very attractive little place in northern Norway, normally pronounced and spelt snoring. And there you'll find lovely little cottages with... Uh, Peter Jones, a challenge. If it's spelt and pronounced snoring, it isn't snoring, is it? Depends how you say it. Most people actually say snoring, even though they mean snoring. No, but you say it is pronounced snoring and it's written snoring. By the, nor by the laps, actually. <laughs> yes, well, so I see, I see his I'm point. interested in minorities always. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not broadcasting for the laps. Uh, now, th this program uh, is very, very popular on the World Service in those parts of northern Norway. Yes. I know it and is. I, I, most of them have lacked. I, 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 I know that. I know that because... And we had a whole party of Norwegians came in the studio one yes, time. Yes, I get shoals of letters from Lapland, or as they say over there, schools of uh, letters. <laughs> or muffins, as they call them. <clears throat> You've yes. made your point, Peter. Yes, I think I so. disagree with it. Oh, you disagree with <laughs> it? <laughs> because the English the people or British board. people and a lot of other nationalities might still pronounce it as snoring and therefore he's not deviating from the subject. Yes, uh, I agree with you. And uh, really Martin, I leave the subject with you, snoring, 41 seconds, starting now. In snoring, people travel on sledges or dog sleighs in order to get to work or go to school. There's only one school, actually, in snoring. Uh, Derek Nemo challenged. Two schools. There were two schools, yes. He said there was only one. So there, <laughs> there is only one, yes. 
32 seconds for you, uh, Derek, on snoring starting now. It's raining, it's pouring, the old man's snoring. I remember reciting that little rhyme as a child, as a date outside my schoolmistress's window. She used to come and look at me and throw a tin can because she hated to be told that she was snoring, of course, because I had never actually heard her at it, but it's been rumoured by the school caretaker that she was uh, a snorer. Kenneth Williams, child. School twice. School twice. I'm sorry, uh, Derek. Uh, mm -hmm. Kenneth, you have the subject of snoring and 12 seconds starting now. This is something that can be cured straight away as long as you arrange a pillow correctly so that the breathing is more convenient. <laughs> So, snoring kept Kenneth going till the whistle went, gained an extra point. He's still in third place, a little behind Derek Nimmo, just ahead of Martin Jarvis, and Peter Jones is still out in the lead. And, Kenneth, you begin the next round. The subject is Hercules and the Hydra, and you have 60 seconds, as usual, starting now. The Hydra was a challenge to Hercules. There is no question of that. And too often people forget Eolaus, who helped him slay this serpent whose breath was so deadly it could kill. Now, his friend burned the forest and taking a brand, he actually maimed the creature, whereupon Hercules committed the final execution and actually buried the head and dipped his arrow into the blood which rendered it lethal in itself and all this occurred in the Peloponnese a place called Lerna and it lives on <laughs> will tell our listeners that not only did the audience clap ecstatically, but also the other panellists clapped. Kenneth's brilliance to keep going on such subject for 60 seconds without being interrupted and be consistently interesting and informative. And um, he gains <laughs> that extra point for speaking when the whistle went, but a bonus for not being interrupted. So two points there, Kenneth. And you're still in... No, you're, si you're now in second place alongside Derek Nimmo, but still behind our leader, Peter Jones. Martin uh, Jarvis, will you begin the next round? The subject, Martin, is phobias. Will you tell us something about those in the game starting now? Phobias are irrational fears of things or people, perhaps like Nicholas Parsons would be a good example. <laughs> very frightened of a person like that. Phobia also is stage fright. For instance, the actor who couldn't remember his lines, we're all frightened of doing that, uh, on the... And Derek Nimmo Chow. Oh. Yes, he uh, oh, there. Right, and uh, there are 42 seconds for you, Derek, on phobias starting now. Yes, my sister has agoraphobia, which is a very unpleasant thing because she doesn't like going outside very much. And therefore, most of her existence is sheer and desperate torture because she's stuck in one room except occasionally when she manages to... Uh, can you a challenge? This isn't true. His sister's not stuck in one room. <laughs> oh, I mean, every time I've seen her, she's been as large as life, twice as natural, and certainly enjoying Knightsbridge. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll put this to the audience. <laughs> if you've seen Derek's sister in Nicebridge, <laughs> well, I don't know whether Derek's sister's in the room he or whether she's in Nicebridge. West of Great Portland Street, does it? But you do stick her in one room listening to this, which she'll be doing at this moment. She, yeah. she doesn't move out for it, darling. No. Very, very sad. So we have to believe that Derek was speaking the truth then and uh, tell him to continue with phobias with 25 seconds left starting now. Another kind of phobia that one can develop is a tremendous hatred for people who are snoring. I remember a schoolmistress of my acquaintance who was once frightened by a bunyip and therefore developed this terrible phobia because every time she travelled across the Antipodes, the phobia would come upon her. And not only a phobia for that, but for mosquitoes as well. <laughs> and his wife.
Well, Derek Nimmo, an experienced exponent of the game, illustrated another way to keep going when all else has failed, bring in aspects of all the subjects that we discussed already. I was just getting round with Sam Goon, if you hadn't interrupted. Who <laughs> <laughs> was bitten by a mosquito, uh, and he was not... Anyway, it doesn't matter. Derek, you move forward there. One for speaking as a whistle wind takes you. One behind our leader, Peter Jones, and I think it's your turn to begin. Yes, it is. The subject is weights. Will you tell us something about those in just a minute, starting now? Weights and measure, but I think I'll talk first of all about weights used in their caroling sense. Those people who were employed by the courts of old to wander around and give the time, and then eventually, at the Christmas tide, sang pretty songs outside the doors. You've all heard singers of one kind or another pitching up at Yuletide and giving you a little rendition of some popular tune. They are called Waits, because they had to do that outside. They had to wait. And that's why they and were... Martin Jarvis, Chancellor. There was a repetition of outside. That's right. You did say outside. <laughs> outside the um, people singing outside, and then you said outside again. So, Martin, you have a correct challenge and 29 seconds on waits starting now. When I was at school coming home on the bus with my friend Philip um, Halley, we used to buy waits. <laughs> we used to go into the shop and say... Two weights, please, because you could get them a little tiny packet and light up, and the bus conductor would very often tell us <laughs> to get off the bus. Because uh, Derek Nemo challenge. A repetition of bus. You get on the bus too often, yes. I'm afraid, yes. That's right. So, Derek, you've got in with 13 seconds on weights starting now. The holly and the ivy, when they are both full-grown, of all the trees that are in the wood, the aforementioned bears the crown. That was one of the songs <laughs> the weights used to do at this particular December the 25th that I was... <laughs> Um. So Derek Nimmo kept going to the whistle went and now has overtaken our leader who was Peter Jones but Peter begins the next round Peter the subject is Bogner Regis will you tell us something about that delightful town in the game starting now it really is a very pleasant town slightly seedy with the paint on the verandas peeling but these white buildings that are battle-scarred, and it was a favourite place for George V. He used to visit that place to uh, uh, convalesce. Kenneth Williams, two Charles. Places. There were two places. Oh, yes, there were. Here's that yeah. place and visit that place. Kenneth, you have Bognor Regis, and you have 43 seconds starting now. It was in Bognor Regis that Beecham was told, and he was one of the world's great conductors, that Malcolm Sargent was returning from the Far East, and he said, oh, another flash in Japan. <laughs> well, <laughs> everyone around was impressed by this wit, and they said Bogner was all the better for it, because as... Ja oh. <laughs> Martin Jarvis challenged. Yes, I, I got mixed up there. There, yeah. there was a... There, well... He, Kenneth said it himself. There was a bit of a mix-up, although it was yes, extremely no, interesting. It be construed as a hesitation. Yeah. It could be. It could be. Oh, I was going to give you the benefit of the doubt, but, well, uh, very oh, generous of you, Kenneth. Very decent of you, Kenneth. Martin has 14 seconds on Bogner Regis starting now. When George V was lying ill in bed, the man by his side, his doctor, said, Don't worry, Your Majesty. Uh, Derek Nimmo, child. I can't believe the doctor was in bed with King George V. <laughs> Deviation. <laughs> No, he was lying because, in fact, if you're going to listen, he, he wasn't, in fact, saying the <laughs> truth. He was trying to cheer him up. He was going no, to I don't something. believe he and the doctor were in bed together when he was ill. Oh, I never suggested they were in bed together. He had a bedside manner, this doctor. He was beside the bed. Oh, yeah, and he was going to, yeah. He might have done it, yes, to cheer him yeah. up. He might have got him with him too. <laughs> 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 I think that, uh, the, that what we'll do is, as you're in the lead, and Martin, as a guest, we're giving the benefit of the doubt, because it was kind. a slip of the tongue, but he didn't mm -hmm. deviate from Bogner Regis, and say you have seven seconds on the subject, starting now. And the doctor said, don't worry, Your Majesty, soon it will and be... And Peter Jones, a child. Repetition of doctor. Yes, the doctor, you mentioned him before. Oh, did I? Yeah, it was a bit devious yeah. what he was doing, but certainly uh, now. Yeah. He's been mentioned well, twice. That is repetition. Peter, you have five seconds on Bogner Regis starting now. He said, Bogner will do you the world of good. And the old king replied, <laughs> Bogner. <laughs> well, Derek actually challenged you before that. Well, I'm just relieved that it wasn't the doctor who said, <laughs> Bogner, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, I, was, 
I was, <laughs> it was repetition of King that I was going to Repetition of King, yes. Yes, well, there you are. One's finding out quite a lot on this programme yeah. today, really. So, um, it, he did actually repeat the word King. I'm very sorry, um, Peter, <laughs> so you've got in you with... You allow bad language on this programme. You're going to allow that. But it and nothing true. I can do he about it. It's a spontaneous a show. Totally whatever. a decent family audience. <laughs> <laughs> whatever comes out, comes out, because that's how it goes. Well, he's credited with a number of last words. Another phrase that uh, he was credited with was... How goes the empire? Uh, that's not as funny, I suppose. As funny. <laughs> but, um, Unless your name is Mr. Moss, I guess. <laughs> he did actually say that, and so Peter was repeating it. Perhaps he shouldn't have done it in a family show which is going round the world and might affect a certain people's susceptibilities, but Derek got in, alas... Well, if I shouldn't have said it, certainly the king shouldn't have said it. <laughs> <laughs> And on, and on his deathbed, it didn't give him much time to make his peace, did it? Um, there are, there's half a second for you, Derek, on Bogner Regis starting now. Bogner Regis is... <laughs> so Derek, uh, getting in just before the whistle, gaining an extra point as well, has increased his lead over Peter Jones at the end of that round. Mar uh, Kenneth Williams is in third place, followed by Martin Jarvis, and Kenneth begins the next round. And rather aptly, after what Martin said about the king and the doctor, the next subject is falling out of bed. <laughs> Can you tell us something about that, Kenneth, in the, just a minute, starting now? This actually happened to me, and I'll tell you why. It was because <laughs> the surroundings were strange. And when I woke, almost somnambulant, I might add, I had imagined I was in my own place. Well, alas. Yes, this was not so. Thinking that by putting the foot out from under the sheets, I would reach the ground in a certain time, which I calculated in the intellectual <laughs> sense of that word, I made an error and found the ground further from me than I had anticipated. Consequently, I went over with a terrible crash. Luckily, no jerry or chamber pot was in the way. <laughs> Otherwise, it might have been even worse. But no, the springs shut me. <laughs> <laughs> well, this could be a record for just a minute. Uh, in the same show... De Kenneth Williams started with the subject and finished with the subject without being interrupted. Well done again, Kenneth. A point for speaking as the whistle went, a point for not being interrupted. He and did, He did repeat Graham, but I thought he was being very funny. Yeah. He was being very entertaining, and uh, he kept going marvellously. <laughs> Kenneth, you're two points behind Peter Jones, a few behind our leader Derek Nimmo, and just ahead of Martin Jarvis. And Martin, will you begin the next round, which might be the last in this week's show. The subject is A Flash in the Pan. Oh, dear. <laughs> I might tell you the dear Mester thinks of these subjects way in advance of the show so there's no premeditation in any of this because who's to know what's going to come next especially in just a minute so that's the subject and will you talk on it Martin starting now a friend of mine at school called Philip Hinton who often used to come to my house with fireworks and I occasionally went home on the bus with him once took me to a conjuring show and this conjurer who was absolutely marvellous, put a wonderful kind of uh, piece of fl flash paper. Uh, Derek Nimmo, Charles. Uh, I think uh, it was hesitation, yes. Martin, uh, I'm afraid. Uh, there are 44 seconds left for you, Derek, to talk on a flash in the pan starting so now. So when Sam Gowin telephoned Kenneth Williams and said, I'd like to see your flash in the pan, they took him into the Handley adjacent laboratory, which had just been vacated by Mrs. Peter Jones, who'd returned from a mosquito hunting expedition <laughs> in the Camargue. And that really was a flash in the pan, because... He very seldom took her down to that particular part of the world, let alone sleep with her, as we well know. And so, to find them both together, the famous film uh, director... Peter Jones, a challenge. <laughs> Hesitation. Absolutely, Peter, yes. There are 17 seconds with you, Peter, on a flash in the pan starting now. This is something that happens very rarely. It's not quite as unusual as Halley's Comet, which I believe occurs only once every several years. But nevertheless... When you observe the repetition of this occurrence, 
It can be amazing. <laughs> So, Peter Jones is speaking as the whistle went and gained that all-important extra point. And the last that we have no more time to play, just a minute. So, I'll give you the final situation. Um, Martin Jarvis, our guest, who has done so well in the past, uh, well, he contributed marvellously as usual, but he did finish in points a few behind Kenneth Williams, who contributed a tremendous amount because he spoke incessantly, but only got, uh, uh, what, four points behind uh, Peter Jones, who just caught up with Derek Nimmo, and we have two joint winners at the end of this edition of Just a Minute, Peter Jones with Derek Nimmo. <laughs> well, we do hope you've enjoyed uh, this edition of Just a Minute, and we'll want to tune in again at the same time next week when we take the air and we play this delightful and uh, sometimes impossible game, but tremendous fun. Until then, from all of us here, goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The program was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by Pete Atkin. Present Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud, Peter Jones, and Henry Kelly in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, as you've just heard, we have three of our regular players of the game, Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud, and Peter Jones. And to join us once again in the guest chair, someone who's played the game with success before, Henry Kelly. Let's welcome all four of them. As I will remind you that I'm going to ask them to speak, if they can, separately on the subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from that subject. And we'll begin the show this week with Clement Freud. Clement, the subject is seals. Will you tell us something about those in the game starting now? Seals are very agreeable animals. They look a bit like walruses, which is why we mind so much when they're clubbed to death in Canada and other places. I haven't met any seals personally and wouldn't know how nice or agreeable or xenophobic they are as animals, but um, on the whole... Uh, Kenneth Williams' challenge. Well, he, he hesitated. He, he said, hesitated. But, um, definitely yes, hesitated, um, yes. He um, erred within the rules of the game and in every other sense. And, uh, uh, Kenneth, I agree with your challenge, therefore you get a point for a correct challenge and you take over the subject of seals starting... Oh, 40 seconds starting now. I once knew a girl who used to prance around in a seal skin coat, which she thought very highly of. And I said, do you know about the kind of inhumanity that goes into collecting those pelts? And she said, no! Nah, I fear I couldn't care less. And I thought, well, that typifies it, doesn't it? Where do you stand when they turn round and make that sort of dismissive remark? <laughs> So, Kenneth Williams kept going till the whistle went and gained an extra point for doing so. And as I just remind you, if you've never heard the game before, that after 60 seconds the whistle is blown and uh, they stop. And Kenneth Williams is the only one to have scored any points in that round. And uh, the next subject is falling in love. And Peter Jones, will you take that and tell us something about it in the game starting now? Falling in love. Well, I think the verb is the most significant part of that sentence. Love is a wonderful thing. Love makes the world go round, I've heard. I don't happen to agree with that sentiment. I think strong drink is what makes the world go round. <laughs> but love... Uh, Henry Kennedy has challenged. What? Henry has challenged you. Henry. It sounded to me as if we had a bunch of the worlds going round. Yeah. Yes, there was more than one world going round. Love makes the world go round, and you thought drink makes the world go round. So that's, that's repetition, right. Peter. Yes. 
And uh, Henry Kelly, you have a point and the subject and 42 seconds falling in love starting now. Would be a very difficult thing to do if one was on the edge of the Niagara Falls because one might end up in the drink. That is not the particular substance that uh, Peter Jones had in question when he lost the subject to me a couple of moments ago. And Kenny Williams, Deviation. The yes. subject is falling in love. We've had a lot of stuff about Niagara Falls. We've had a lot of stuff about Peter Jones. We've had nothing about falling in love. He was deviating. 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 Deviating
And you have 32 seconds on electrifying the audience starting now. The thing to do is to pass an electrode underneath their feet and make them all very wet indeed, and you would in succeed in electrifying them all, you see. Of course, it would have to be a minor shock, otherwise you'd be a mass exterminator. <laughs> The audiences would cease to be. Theatres would be empty and people would... Uh, Peter Jones, a challenge. A repetition of theatres. Peter, how nice to hear from you. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> very nice. He did say, repeat though. the word theatre because he'd used it before Minnelli Wallace and with uh, Elaine uh, <laughs> Ellen Terry. And there are six seconds for you, uh, Peter Jones, electrifying the audience starting now. I wouldn't put 230 votes through them. I think perhaps 115 would be sufficient. <laughs> And they let him get away with the one, one, five. We let him get away yeah, with yes. it. Henry and I both acknowledged him. We let him get away with it because you know why? why? We're naturally gallant, you see, and charming, good mannered, well mannered. Speak know. for yourself. Oh. <laughs> really? Anyway, Peter Jones got a point for speaking as the whistle went. He's now got two points, but Kenneth Williams still out in a strong lead. Clement Freud and Henry Kelly have won, and Henry begins the next round. Henry, the subject is what I keep in old jam jars. Will you tell us something about that in the game starting now? Basically, what I keep in old jam jars is a sort of a strawberry doobries which has seen better days. That is to say, what else would you keep in old jam jars except something that you probably wouldn't really want to eat at the moment that it was made? You wouldn't want to spread it on toast. But... Uh, Clement Freud challenge. You wouldn't want to. You repeat. wouldn't want to. It took repeat. you ages. <laughs> no, he was being generous. 40 seconds for Clement on what I keep in old jam jars starting now. What I keep in old jam jars is primarily old jam. <laughs> Strawberry, raspberry, <laughs> cherry, pear, ginger-flavoured marmalade, which is also a kind of confection, which is akin to jam. Uh, Clayton Jones challenge. Uh, which, he said. Which twice. is, yes, yes, he repeated that. So, Peter, you got in with 27 se 28 seconds. What I keep in old jam jars starting now. I keep air. Whenever I go on holiday, be it to Frinton-on-Sea or Llandudno or Albuquerque, I open a jam jar and allow the air of the country to go into it. <laughs> Slap the top uh, on. He, he hesitated immediately, he came to didn't a he? shuddering halt yes, all his air in his mm. jam jar. Yes. What a bizarre life he leads. <laughs> the things that are revealed in just a minute. Kenneth, you've got in with 12 seconds on what I keep in old jam jars, starting now. I keep in old jam jars screws and things like, you know, nails, because they're very handy if you're short of that sort of stuff. And the other thing I put in a jam jar is... So once again, Kenneth Williams was speaking as the whistle went and has increased his lead. And not only has he got this lead, but he's a commanding one. Uh, Clement, will you talk on the subject of genealogy with 60 seconds to go, starting now? When I was born, I achieved a moment of great fame in that I was the youngest person in the whole world for that short moment when I came into, onto this earth. Uh, Henry Kelly challenge. I think in this game, if you say into, onto, onto, into I think I would have interpreted as hesitation. Class of yes. hesitation. Henry, you have 44 seconds. Genealogy starting now. It is a very interesting subject to examine because it will allow you to discover who your parents were, your grandparents, a hyphenated word I trust you will note. And indeed, if you had either of those particular groups in your genealogical tree, I want uh, Clement Freud challenge. It would be impossible to have a genealogical tree without parents and grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> So, Clement, with that good challenge, you take over the subject of genealogy, and there are 27 seconds left starting now. I come from a very long line of people, and I challenge... Uh, Henry Kelly challenged. Ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You couldn't come from a long line of animals, could you? Yes. Uh, so, I disagree, yes, but you... A nice point, Henry, and so um, you still keep the subject. Don't look so surprised, Clement, it's all right. You have another point for being interrupted. 23 seconds starting now. On my paternal side, they were all called Freud, whereas on my mother's, they had all sorts of names, some of which I now forget and others I never knew. My wife 
who is here sitting in the first row, has an enormously eclectic number of relatives, many of whom I've met and some of whom uh, came to Peter our... Jones Chum. A repetition of relatives. No. Yeah. Well, no. No, he didn't say Nobody that. remembers but me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, relative. No, no. no, no. Relative. Yes. So, uh, so, Cameron, you still have the subject, and there are two and a half seconds on genealogy starting now. Fluid is a very good name indeed. Troy got a large number of points in that round, including the one for speaking as the whistle went, and uh, he has moved forward, but Kenneth Williams is still in the lead, and Peter Jones begins the next round. The subject, Peter, is petty cash. Will you tell us something about that in the game, starting now? Well, cash is never petty unless it belongs to other people. <laughs> One's own is always important. If I could persuade every old age pension to send me a pound, I should be comparatively wealthy. I wish I were able to do that. Um. <laughs> Can you tell us? Well, he just stopped. I know he did. I think he was only made well. his radio appeal for Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was shattered by the by the thought of his it appeal. Was the sheer effrontery of it. The other sheer effrontery uh, of me, yes. appealing to the old age pensioners. My goodness me. Yes, I take I, that back. You, only you didn't get a... anything yet. <laughs> <laughs> you just about to join them, aren't you? The, um... Uh, uh, Kenneth, you had a correct challenge, and you have 42 seconds on petty cash starting now. Well, I believe it's what's kept in the office for a sort of, you know, everyday float expenses that will be encountered by the office junior, <clears throat> or perhaps the secretary who has to go out and purchase some stamps or something of that nature. I don't really know an awful lot about petty cash, and certainly nobody's ever said to me, it is at your disposal. I would rather like it because I deal largely in paper, and I have to always insist at the bank that the notes are clean because I can't stand germs. And I've always thought when they look dirty and wrinkled, oh, I might I get some terrible disease, you know, because it's easy to catch these things, you know. They can be easily passed on. Uh... So, once again, um, Kenneth took the subject and kept going magnificently to the whistle went and not only got that extra point but has increased his lead. And Kenneth, you also begin the next round. Diogenes, will you tell us something about him in this game starting now? What is very little known about Diogenes is that he was initially a bit of a rake and led a dissolute life until he came under the influence of Antisthenes in Athens and then devoted himself to the school of cynic philosophy, advocating eschewing all luxury, no interest in the arts, but saying hard suffering must be my lot. And he sat in this barrel where he was visited by the Emperor Alexander, who said, What should I do? And Diogenes replied, Get out of my light. And he <laughs> went away saying, If I had to be another man, I would be Diogenes. <laughs> Well, once again, Kenneth Williams with his uh, erudition and knowledge kept going on a subject from beginning to end uh, without interruption, so he gets a point for speaking as the whistle went and a bonus point and has increased his lead way ahead for the first time, I think, for a long while, way ahead of everyone else. Henry Kelly, will you take the next round? The subject, spaghetti. Will you tell us something about that stringy subject in just a minute, starting now? The most interesting thing about spaghetti is that there was once a television program on the British Broadcasting Corporation <laughs> a number of years ago in which it was decided that because it was April Fool's Day, they would try and trick members of the Italian nation. Not a lot of people know that that particular country is actually run by real people. There is a, a rumor there is that it is in fact organized by a group of gentlemen known as the Mafia, as opposed to Ireland, which is run by a group of gentlemen known as the Murphy. 
Alicia. On this particular day, it's coming after the 31st of March, it was decided to trick people and pretend that spaghetti could in fact be grown in the Cotswolds. Not only that, it could be grown anywhere in Gloucestershire. It could even be grown up as far north as uh, Manchester. Peter Jones, a challenge. Well, repetition of grow. Yes, you let the second one go, but you picked him up on the third. Yes. It was going to be a great Sardio. story. <laughs> Fifteen seconds for you, Peter, on spaghetti starting now. Fettuccine and linguine are other types of pasta, but perhaps the most popular the world over is spaghetti, which can be served with tomato sauce or with a meat sauce, which I never... Uh, Clement Freud, a challenge. A uh, repetition of sauce. There were two sauces, yes. yes. And so Clement got in with uh, two and a half seconds on spaghetti starting now. Spaghetti is a cross between vermicelli and macaroni. Well, Clement Freud has moved forward in that round. Kenneth Williams is still our leader. Clement takes the next round. The subject, Clement, homemade beer. Will you tell us something about that in the game, starting now? It's an extraordinary thing, but I've never tasted nice homemade beer. Homemade food, homemade wine are delicious and acceptable, and one tends to say, I would prefer to have it in the comfort of your four uh, Henry walls Kelly, out challenge. in a restaurant. Well, either he has a respiratory infection, or that was a <laughs> hesitation. I agree with the hesitation, and you have 46 seconds on homemade beer starting now. Although I would tend to agree that I, too, have never tasted anything remotely like a decent homemade beer. On the other hand, I can appreciate that there are people who are dedicated to the pursuit of organizing themselves so that they, in fact, do hardly anything else in their lives except go to the supermarket and buy this liquid in a box. I ask you, could you possibly believe anything that you bought in such a receptacle could actually be liquid? Yet they buy it and they take it. Uh, Clement Freud challenge. Repetition of liquid. Yes. Uh, yeah. Clement, you have 13 seconds on homemade beer starting now. There is a factory on the south coast of England where homemade beer sets are sold and you can get, for the price of eight pounds and seventy-five pence, some... Uh, Henry Kelly challenged again. He breathes. <laughs> yes, and I would interpret that as hesitation to Correct. two seconds on homemade beer, Henry, starting now. As I was saying when I was so strangely interrupted. <laughs> So Henry got some points in that round. He's moved forward into third place ahead of Peter Jones and Clement Freud's ahead of him and Kenneth Williams is still our leader. Peter, the subject is an odd fact. Will you start with it as usual, 60 seconds beginning now? I suppose it is an odd fact that I'm here at all after so many years since I am quite incapable of speaking without hesitating, insulting the chairman and often repeating myself, let alone the pauses that are sprinkled through every utterance that I make, perhaps. But I, uh... <coughs> <laughs> And as an odd fact, but you hesitated and Kenneth Williams got in, and there are 37 seconds. An odd fact, Kenneth, starting now. I've got toes which overlap, and the chiropodist said you should have an operation whereby we straighten them. And I said, why? He said, because later on in life, you will find yourself wandering along as one afflicted instead of your usual buoyant gait. I said, you're very sweet. But I described it. He said, I certainly would. <laughs> Well, I will tell you an odd fact, because Kenneth Williams always gives good value, but he often finishes in fourth place. He's not only in the lead, but he keeps increasing his lead. He's way out ahead of everybody else. Henry, I think we're entering the last round. We'd like you to take it. The subject is limelight. Will you tell us something about that in the game starting now? Limelight is said to be a very interesting thing to be in. I would not know I has never entered it. Now, the thing about it is that there are various ways, I understand, in which one can cross the threshold from the darkness and be a person like many of the distinguished people who are here in this panel tonight. As you know, I am just a mere guest. The Clement Freuds of this world, the Kenneth Williams, the Peter Joneses. And as I... Kenneth Williams challenge. Well, he's practically gone into diminuendo. I can hardly hear him. 
Some of them the back here have dropped off. Yeah. <laughs> so what was your challenge? Well, in audibility and uh, 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 well, it is. Uh, <coughs> and uh, the, deviation. And, yes, because he said the word the four times. That's didn't right. It? I meant to say that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's and right. And he referred to Kenneth Williams and me as being in the plural. He said the Kenneth Williams is and the Peter Jones is. There's only one of us. There's That's only right. one. Kenneth one Williams deviation. Definitely. Yes. Yes. Between the three of them, they've managed to get a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth, I agree with your challenge. There are 35 seconds on Limelight starting now. Well, it was a very good film, you know, but they ruined it with that dark music. Now, what they should have done was to have me, and I phoned up Hollywood, and I said... Uh, Henry Kelly challenge. If I'm going to be challenged on they three times, he can be challenged on it twice. <laughs> well, you have to be sure. You are right, Henry, and you take the subject back with 27 seconds. Limelight starting now. Also, it might be said that it is the type of light which would come were one to take a lime, that wonderful fruit, first cousin of a lemon, second cousin of an orange, third cousin... And one. Clement Freud Child. Well done, Clement. Cousins. <laughs> Got this. All those cousins. All, all those cousins, yes. The Clement. speed of the man. <laughs> you have limelight, Clement, and 17 seconds starting now. Just before Kenneth Williams phoned Hollywood to see whether he could be in the film, <laughs> I went to the Haverstock Hill Odeon wearing a school cap which was pink with a Maltese cross upon it and paid one and threepence to see that motion picture for myself. And I thought Charlie Chaplin gave one of the very great performances. Clement Freud brought that round to an end, gained an extra point, and it also brings the show to an end. So let me give you the final score. Peter Jones, who a few weeks ago triumphed magnificently, unfortunately finished only in fourth place, but as always, it's not what the points they gain, but what they contribute. As usual, it was fairly evenly divided. Then came Henry Kelly just ahead of him, then Clement Freud. But the man who took the lead at the beginning, kept the lead throughout, who electrified the audience and never faltered for a moment, this week's winner, Kenneth Williams! <laughs> so your remark, Kenneth, about I never win but I don't mind has come true. You have won and you do mind and the audience minded and they show their appreciation. We hope you've enjoyed the show this week. We hope you want to tune in again at the same time next week when we all take to the air and we play just a minute from then from all of us here. Goodbye. <laughs> The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by Pete Atkin. Present Kenneth Williams, Derek Nimmo, Clement Freud and Sheila Hancock in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello and welcome once again to Just a Minute. And as you've just heard this week, once more we had three of our regular competitors of the game and we welcome back as our guest somebody who has played the game with great success in the past, Sheila Hancock. Once again, I'm going to ask our contestants to speak, if they can, on the subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. And Clement Freud, we'd like you to begin the show this week, and the subject is milking a camel. <laughs> can you tell us something about that particular subject in this ridiculous game starting now? In order to milk a camel, you first of all have to identify the animal. Ogden Nash said, a camel has a single hump, a dromedary too, Perhaps it's the other way round. I'm not sure, are you? And this poet is particularly famous for having written, I shot a hippopotamus 
Uh, Derek Nimmerchan. There's no attempt to milk the camel. He's reciting poems. You have got that, to wonder... explain how to find a camel before you can milk yes, a camel. Yes, but then you went off about Ogden Nash and dromedaries as well. So I, I think you had deviated somewhat from really? the subject of milking. So I will give uh, Derek the subject and a, a point for a correct challenge, of course, and tell him he has 42 <coughs> and a half seconds to take over the subject starting now. I was first allowed to milk a camel by Sheikh Rashid San Mohammed in Dubai in the United uh, Arab Emirates. Uh, Kenneth Williams. Deviation, his name's dropping. <laughs> not telling us anything about milk in a case, but, just tells us about the important people he knows. That's <laughs> all. Have you ever known Derek ever do anything else? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I think that's... Uh, but anyway, no, no, he can name drop as much as he likes on just a minute. In fact, you can do anything you like, provided you stick to the subject. And don't hesitate or repeat yourself, and Derek didn't do that. There are 35 seconds for him to continue, having gained a point for a wrong challenge. Milking a camel, starting now. Wilfred Thesiger, the first man to cross the empty quarter, had to rely tremendously on camel milk. And if you read his book, Desert Sands, you will see within it a whole chapter devoted to the art of squeezing the udders of camels and producing this rather stringy, nasty milk. It's a brownish colour, not to be recommended, particularly for small children, although apparently tiny camels quite enjoy it. Now, <laughs> you have to have a bar Clement, stool. Chuck. Hesitation. Yes, I think uh, after the another was a hesitation after you talked about the baby camels. Clement, I agree with your challenge, and you have seven seconds on milking a camel starting now. A camel's udder hangs at the rear and a number of teeth protrude, <laughs> which you must grasp in your hands and squeeze. When Ian Messiter blows his whistle, it tells us that 60 seconds is up, and whoever is speaking at that moment gains an extra point. On this occasion, it was Clement Freud who started the round. So he's equal with Derek at the end of the first round, and Derek would like you to begin the second round, and the subject is a short address. Will you tell us something about that in the game, starting now? I suppose a tolerably short address would be Buckingham Palace, England, which would always get your mail to the place that you wanted to go to. Another one might be, uh, what should we say, Warwick Castle. Uh, Sheila Hancock. Yeah, she said er. Uh, he definitely said er, uh, yes. He erred there within the game as well as saying it, and therefore, Sheila, you have a correct challenge of point and 47 seconds on a short address starting now. A short address was something that I always used to enjoy when I went to church as a child, as opposed to a long one given by the vicar. And it was very pithy and to the point and enjoyable, usually with a quotation from the Bible. A friend of mine lives in the street. Clement Freud, child. Hesitation. No. <laughs> Sheila, you continue on the short address. <laughs> Seventeen and a half seconds, starting now. The Village, England. I have had letters reach me with just the address Sheila Hancock, England, which I was immensely... Uh, Derek Nemo, of England. Yes. Yes, right, I'm afraid yes. so. Derek, ten seconds for you on a short address, starting now. My address today, I would like to take as my text the words of the prophet Micah, chapter 5, verse 4, in which he says, When the bell soundeth, then wilt thou come. Which could, I suppose, more colloquially be translated... <laughs> So, Derek Nimmo was speaking as the whistle went, gained an extra point on the subject with which he started, lost and regained, and he's in the lead at the end of the round. Sheila Hancock, will you begin the next round? Avoiding tax. That is what Ian Messiter has decided will be the subject. Can you talk on it for just a minute, starting now? This is something that I got very good at last Christmas when I was putting up my decorations and all the tacks kept falling in the carpet. <laughs> and I discovered that if you wear very thick-soled shoes, then you can usually avoid the tacks. But there is another sense in which I am not very good at this, though I try, as does everybody else in this country. I understand if you go and live abroad, you can avoid tax, but that seems to me a singularly boring solution, as I actually do like living in this country. Uh, Derek, no more challenge. Repetition of country. Yes, mm. I'm afraid you repeated your country, and Derek got in when 25 seconds... Uh, with him now to talk on avoiding tax starting now. Well, I'm sure I avoid tax by using a staple gun. These are marvellous machines. <laughs> Sheila Jones. Deviation, I've never avoided tax by using a staple gun. I said you have to wear thick soled shoes <laughs> to avoid tax. Absolutely right. Well tried. Give her a point. I don't mac about. I mean, <laughs> generous to a fault, I am. 
Do you want to give it to her, Derek? Because I think she was of not... Of course I do. I'd be right. delighted that for the head Sheila, of that. you have got the subject with Derek's generosity and there are 11 seconds on avoiding tax starting now. As I seem Derek. to be getting... Derek, Derek no. <laughs> You've got another point from Derek Nimmo and you continue now with 10 seconds starting now. Every single post seems to bring in another tax demand, so I'm obviously singularly useless at avoiding tax. And if anybody listening can give me any hints as to how to do it, I would be very grateful. Clement Floyd challenged before. I can give her a hint. <laughs> <laughs> so what is your challenge? It was... Uh, she challenged me to give her a hint. And no, I, she didn't. Uh, did she asked anybody to write in. You didn't. No, she you didn't. Interrupted. Anyone listening? Anyone listening? Well, I was to listening. Write in. <laughs> but you obviously She asked what? you to write in. She didn't <laughs> want you to jump I will, in the game. I will write, write in. in. <laughs> if you write in... Grovel, so grovel. Anything's worth one point. second there, starting, <laughs> starting now. There are lots of little... <laughs> So, uh, Sheila, oh, she's taken the lead at the end of that round, so she's not avoiding tax, but she's making points anyway. And she's in the lead ahead of Derek Nimmo, and Clement Freud's in third place, and then comes Kenneth Williams, who begins the next round. Kenneth, the subject is sharks. Can you tell us something about those in the game starting now? There are three kinds of sharks, and the one that we're most afraid of is called the man-eater, and it will eat carrion as well as refuse. Now, one of the people that's written a great length about this shark and its problems because it does have difficulty, apparently, in affecting ballast, and so it does swallow, quite deliberately, very heavy objects. Apparently, this gives it a sort of buoyancy that it wouldn't otherwise possess. They have appalling, <laughs> great teeth which, when they're seen in close-up, are very nasty because they don't regularly visit the proper dentists, you see, <laughs> and consequently they're covered in all this brown muck. And then these pilot fish go alongside them, their eyes, actually. They have an incredible sort of feel for the magnetic. Uh, Clement Freud challenge. I thought that was hesitation. Yes, I think it was. So, Clement, um, you have nine seconds for sharks starting now. Another kind of shark about which Kenneth Williams didn't speak is the lone shark who has enough acidity in his stomach to bow burn a hole in your... Uh, Derek Nimmer. Bow burn. He could bow mm. burn. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what happens when you try to keep going under pressure with three people breathing down your me neck, metaphorically speaking, to get in. And Derek did it with one second to go, and the subject is still sharks. Derek starting now. Skin diving off here, man, in the streets of Malaysia. <laughs> So Derek's now in the lead, one ahead of Sheila Hancock. Uh, the next subject is for Derek to begin, and it's a strange thing I saw on my travels. Oh, we're going to have more of all this name dropping and place dropping, aren't we now? <laughs> right, so Derek, there are 60 seconds, starting now. I think probably one of the strangest things that I've seen on my travels takes place at the Batu Caves outside Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. These great limestone rocks tar into the sky, and at four o'clock in the morning on this particular day of the year with Thai Possum's festival, you hear the drums beginning to beat, these Hindu tom etc. that bang away the rhythm into the night. And slowly, a great black line of figures crosses the ground towards the carriage. Uh, Clement Freud, Charles. Repetition of great, and hesitation, and a few other things. And he didn't drop any names. Deviation. <laughs> You did repeat the word great, I'm afraid, because I was actually getting very interested. It made me it want to go to the interesting. Yes. It gets better later on, I can tell you. Mm. <laughs> well, I hope we get the subject back, Derek, mm. and we hear more about it. But in the meantime, I must be fair, because Clement had a correct challenge, and he has 30 and a half seconds on a strange thing I saw on my travels, starting now. One of the strangest things I ever saw on any travel of which I've partaken <laughs> was Kenneth Williams, whom I caught out of the corner of my eye, leaning behind me on an aeroplane bound for the Middle East. Like, uh, Derek Nimmo, Charles. Deviation. Kenneth's never been to the Middle East. On the contrary. Yeah. Not with Clement Freud, I'm an you old habituary around Cairo cafes. And I've been known. I've been known. With, with, I'm, I'm with not Clement the Freud? Limit. I'm a cult. I'm a cult. <laughs> I'm a, a cult they, in Cairo. They say, they say I'm one of the biggest cults in the Middle East, don't they, don't they Kenneth? Yes. Wherever you go in the Levant, they say, Ah, oh, I've caught Penny Williams out of the corner of my eye. Yes. Yeah. 
Penny's a cult, they say. We've met it the time we've seen him sipping the mint tea. Mm. A few years ago, you wouldn't go abroad. You thought it was I dirty. know, isn't it funny? We had these sort of conversions, you know, like Saul on the way to Tarsus, was it, or Damascus. I can never remember where he was going. What were you on about, by the way? <laughs> oh, he was getting the subject back, was he? That's right, yes. And he continues with uh, 16 seconds on a strange thing I saw in my travels starting now. And moving towards the pyramids... I heard two actors, and one said to the other, I think I shall get a split week in Peebles. <laughs> For no other reason does one go to Egypt than to overhear one's uh, fellow member uh, of the Derek Emmett, Revolution uh, of Egypt. Yes, you went to Egypt once too often in just a minute. <laughs> Because you can't repeat words, unfortunately. Egypt. One second for Derek on the subject starting now. And the worshippers put dust onto their cheeks. Speaking again, as the whistle went, Derek has uh, gone ahead. He's in the lead, but he's alongside Sheila Hancock, and they're both ahead of Clement Floyd and Kenneth Williams. Sheila, your turn to begin. The subject standing in the corner. 60 seconds, as usual, starting now. I remember being made to do this when I was evacuated and went to a simply horrid school in the country where they didn't like the evacuees very much. And there was this headmistress who we called Miss Greenbum. Her name was actually something to do with green bottom or something. Uh, Kenneth Williams. Well, there was hesitation there, plus the fact that I think that word is disgraceful on a family show. And I, I, I mean, I mean, these people sitting here... It's in Shakespeare. Yes, it's I know, Shakespeare. you're quite right. And it I is, think it's a word that's often banded about in every family, so I don't think... Yes. Uh, well, not it's a, family, a very good think. word, but yes, it's a quite right. word. Yes. <laughs> so what's your challenge? Yes, your hesitation. Has it, no, I don't think she hesitated. Oh, I did. I, did. Well, right. I wound down a bit. Well done. Well, thank mm. you, Sheila. So, Kenneth, you have the subject of green bum. I'm so sorry. <laughs> You have the subject of Standing in the Corner, and there are 41 seconds starting now. Standing in the Corner was one of the punishments at my school. Of course it didn't occur to me, because I was an exemplary pupil, and people said, what a lovely creature you are. Your spun gold hair sprouting from that brainy forehead is a sight that enlivens our hearts. Uh, Sheila Hancock, Chan. He's deviating a bit, isn't he? He's not standing in the corner. I know, but I... have want him to get a few more points. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, he's only got one at the moment. Um, <laughs> you know, you got? You're in the lead with Derek. I've given him one already. I, I said I hesitated when I didn't really. Well, I know you did. Let, let's be generous to him again, because I love him in the corner with his spun gold hair. There we are. <laughs> um, 25 seconds on the subject, Kenneth, okay, starting now. Standing in a corner once, I did put some knick-knacks on a knick-knackery, which was rather amusing because it was arranged in tiny shelves, and little uh, uh, can the I'd like him to have a few more points. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth, you've and, got some more points from Clement this time. 16 seconds on standing in the corner, starting now. And I have to stand in the corner for my mother when she wants the iron plugged in because of the ironing board. Uh, Clement Freud challenged. He almost hesitated, but I'd like him to have another point. <laughs> You almost hesitated because you put your buzzer right under his nose. Anybody would hesitate if you did a thing like that. Uh, uh, you had a legitimate uh, wrong what challenge then. What is this then? big thing you're having with Kenneth this week? Oh, I had a big thing with Kenneth for many weeks, but no one spotted it. <laughs> He's got a great big crush, hasn't he? Yeah. Just a spun gold hair, didn't you know? Ridiculous. What's that? Well, yes, I know. Everybody, he's all, I mean, all this banter that he gives out when he shouts and screams at me, it's all a great cover. Didn't you know that? Right. Kenneth, there are seven and a half seconds on standing in the corner starting now. And standing in the corner of my mother's house. Uh, Clement Floyd Chun. Repetition of mother. Yes, and you were in your mother's corner once before. I've got a fair this time. So Clement's in this time with a challenge I'm going to allow, and there are six seconds on with the subject with you, Clement, starting now. I've always thought that standing in the corner was a very sensible punishment, as opposed to being sent outside the room where you couldn't hear anything at all. <laughs> Well, at the end of that round, Kenneth is still, in spite of everyone's help, in the uh, fourth place. But he's now only two points behind Clement Freud, who's three behind Sheila Hancock and Derek Nimmer, who's still equal in the lead. Uh, Kenneth, it's your turn to begin. The subject, Nijinsky. Will you tell us something about him in the game, starting now? Nijinsky was born in 
here in 1890, and then he studied at the Imperial School in Petrograd. And after that, he went with that incredible man, Diaghilev, to the Mariinsky. And it was in that company that he traveled to Paris, where he had an enormous success. People cried out, oh, and he good. <laughs> and he did this job. Oh, Sheila Hancock, John. When did they cry to, call out, oh, c'est bon, or something like that? Yeah, the French people will be. Didn't establish whether they were French or English. It might have been an Englishman. I in the doubt audience. there were many English people saying, oh, isn't he good? There might have been, so I couldn't right. give it against him for that, could I, really? So let's continue with you, Kenneth on Nijinsky. 27 seconds. <laughs> Starting now. He performed and choreographed Le Frenie de Dufourne, a brilliant dancer, and everyone said a future assured, until, lo, the war broke out, and he got interned in wearable places, Hungary, behind the barbed wire, well, you can imagine the despair into which he was suddenly plunged. <laughs> and that began, as far as I'm Concerned, what was eventually to prove. <laughs> I don't know whether you've heard, for those who are interested, that began, of course, the uh, madness from which he suffered in later life, which Kenneth was going to tell you about, and Kenneth now has leapt forward. <laughs> and he's in third place. Ahead of Clement Freud, but only two behind our joint leaders, Derek Nimmo and Sheila Hancock. And Clement begins the next round. The subject is snorkeling. Will you tell us something about that in the game starting now, Clement? Snorkeling, I believe, is something you do under the water where I've never been because I don't like getting water in my ears. As I've now said water twice and nobody's interrupted me. <laughs> water three times. Yes. Water three times. Derek, there are 51 seconds for you to take over the subject of snorkelling starting now. I'm very sorry for Clement Proy that has never been snorkelling because a whole new world opens up to you, the sheer beauty of that which lies beneath the sea. One of the things that one can do is to dive suddenly down into reasonably aqua pura and there you will see strange insects and creatures and sometimes sea anemones. Now, if you spear one of these with a spike, a sword, anything you might have with you, then thousands of fish rush towards it from all over the water around. It's a uh, Clement Freud. He said sometimes, twice. Yes, he did. That's true. And uh, <laughs> you have the subject, and there are 18 seconds on snorkelling, Clement, starting now. If you go to very smart sports shops, they sell you snorkels, which you are told to put on your head and take to the seaside, where if you enter the bathing surface, you may see beneath it. Uh, Kenneth Williams, shall Oh, it's just deviation and rubbish. I mean, bathing surface. It doesn't, act, just doesn't exist. It's all crap, isn't it? What <laughs> <laughs> a load of rubbish. The bathing oh, surface. De deviation. I, There's I think he was getting a little lost. Of course, he was hopelessly lost, wasn't he? Hopeless. Six seconds for you, Kenneth, on snorkelling starting now. You have these goggles and you get into all this rubber, black rubber, and... <laughs> <laughs> What's the matter? What's the matter? <laughs> Who pressed that button? Well, all the black rubber sent you into a great... Who pressed the button? Me. Derek Nimmo challenged you, yes. Derek Nimmo? Yes. What have you the impertinence to challenge me about? Because you got very overexcited about this black rubber. Black rubber, black rubber, black rubber, black rubber, black rubber all the time. You went into paroxysms of joy over it. I mean, some of the or members of the audience here were looking the other way. They didn't... They were overcome. So one woman was just about to rush up on the stage and grab Are you. Are you saying I've lost the subject or Yes, because you repeated the word rubber. I and didn't repeat the word did rubber, it? did I? <laughs> well, you rotten <laughs> love. <laughs> well, you won't get asked back here again. I'm telling you nothing. They won't get asked, will they? They won't get asked back. Uh, I don't know. They're very you honest. I think we should. Back. <laughs> Perhaps they don't want to come back. <laughs> well, who gets the subject? Derek Nimmer gets the subject. Well, they put Nijinsky the away for 30 years, didn't they? <laughs> And he won the derby. <laughs> <laughs> but he wasn't snorkelling at the time. There are three seconds on the subject of snorkelling starting now. Parrotfish are particularly beautiful to see, and that's why... Ah, uh, well, Derek Nimmo got an extra point for speaking as the whistle went, and he's gained a number of points in that round. He's moved forward... He's in a strong lead, and the other three are very close together in second and third and fourth place. Uh, Derek, your turn to begin. The subject, the Beaujolais. I don't know why 
Ian Messer put the in, but the Beaujolais is the subject starting now. The Beaujolais, I suppose, they wants me to talk about wine rather than the district. I suppose then that I will. Uh, I'm just trying uh, to define the question. Uh, had I started? I don't want the rotten subject, but he said, I suppose, twice. I'm just trying to work out this well. V, isn't the definite article I was wondering. Yes, was I, I was a bit confused by it as well, Derek, but um, you did have to begin. That's oh, the rules see, of right. the game, and you did oh, well, start just to repeat the discourse, word really. subject, as uh, Sheila said, and, and she has. 44 and a half seconds on the Beaujolais starting now. Presumably what Ian means is the district from which this wine comes, of which there are many different areas that I don't know the name of. Beaujolais is a lovely red wine, which actually gives me a migraine, so I don't have it very often. But my old man likes a drop of the Beaujolais. Mind you, he likes a bit of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You will cut that. You will cut it, won't you? you will, you'll cut that. Especially bit. after the Beaujolais. <laughs> <laughs> oh, when's it going out? I'll have to make sure he's not listening. Uh, don't you know off. that nothing's ever edited out of just a no, minute? No, no. I have to keep That's him why we get these... I've had one or two letters. As I said in the letter to this person, if that had been scripted, it could have been double entendre. So Clement... yes, and for the pure authority. Clement Freud has the subject of the Beaujolais, and there are 33 seconds starting now. As Sheila Hancock so very rightly said, the Beaujolais is a district, and it contains Morgan and Bruy and Fleury and Beaujolais Village, and I won't bore you by giving you lots of other names, mainly because I forget them at the moment. The wine should be drunk fairly new. It's a great mistake keep Beaujolais for a long time because it has a lovely fruity raspberry taste when it is freshly from the bottle and it hasn't been too long in cask. You can buy it at any good wine merchant and should of course serve it in a large glass so that it has the chance to breathe or oxidize which is the CIA's name for it. Many people who enjoy the wine are called les Derek Nimmer. Repetition of wine. Yes, but actually we were... We were you, you weren't paying attention. We were trying to let him go on as long as he possibly... Clement, you went ten seconds beyond the time you should have blown the whistle. And so congratulations. <laughs> uh, very interesting. You got a point when you should have gone at 60 seconds. And um, what, what's the score? Oh, what yes, is he Clement. talking about? I can't Never. follow this game at all. It's frightfully influential. Is this a new rule now? Could you explain what you're up to, We go Parsons? on, we do 66 seconds It's all this now, <laughs> do we? No, it's actually. Great, great romance with Kenneth Williams. It turned his head, I think. It shows the state they get me in. <laughs> My goodness me. There, let's begin rattled. another round. It's Sheila's turn, and oh. the subject is my worst moment on stage. Starting now. My worst moment on stage was long ago when I was in a show of No Orchids for Miss Blandish. And I was also the ASM, which, for people who don't know, is the person that helps put up the set and the props. And I obviously hadn't cleated the flats together very reliably. And just when I was about to have a very sexy scene, I noticed that the set was beginning to fall. So therefore, I had to lean against the wall. And in fact, when the young man came on that was supposed to have this seductive scene with me... Uh, Derek Nimmer, Charles. Uh, I remember oh, yes, the scene, really, but I suppose it's yes. mean. It's 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 just got it's to the it was warming up, wasn't it, really? Very mean, I thought. <laughs> <laughs> it was just hearing her story. Wanted, it was I just wanted... starting to get good with this bloke coming in. Yeah. doing <laughs> a seductive thing with her. Seductive And he scene. goes and presses his thing. I yes, might... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, he didn't. He didn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to tell us what actually no, happened? No, no, no. It's All very right, boring. Then. I was just Derek. waffling. Oh, God, what a pity. 25 seconds are left for you, Derek. You've taken over the subject of my worst moment on stage, starting now. was working with that lovely lady of the English theatre, Dame Anna Neagle, who was wearing a throat microphone that went down her bumbles, which was held together by a certain amount of wiring and elastic, and the transmitter was in her knickers. And in the middle of this particularly beautiful dance, the thing snapped. Out came the electronic device from her pants, and she kept on dancing most gallantly. Wonderful applause. It was a tremendous night in the British Theatre. And I want I'll never forget. Hmm. Now, Jerry, perhaps you understand what I mean by we certainly let you go on beyond the time. Because it was lovely here in the end of that story. You've got that extra point for speaking when the whistle should have gone. And I will now give you the final score because we've reached the end of the show this week. Well, it was a very close thing in second place. Sheena Hancock, Clement Freud and Kenneth Williams were equal. And in first place, way out in the lead, was this week's winner, Derek Nemo.
So we hope you've enjoyed this edition of uh, Just a Minute and Derek Nimmo who returned uh, uh, to triumph yet again in the game and we hope that you will want to tune in again when we play Just a Minute. Until then, from all of us here, goodbye. <laughs> The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The program was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by Pete Atkin. present Kenneth Williams, Peter Jones, Derek Nimmo and William Franklin in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome once again to Just a Minute. And as you've just heard, we have three of our regular players of the game and we welcome back in the guest chair someone who didn't win many points when he was here a number of weeks ago but did contribute a great deal to the show. We welcome William Franklin. <laughs> and once again, I'm going to ask them uh, to speak at different times, one hopes, on the subject that I will give them and I hope they're going to do it or this, they will try and do it without hesitation, repetition or deviating from the subject on the card in front of me. And let us begin the show this week with Derek Nimmo. Derek, the subject is hail in just a minute, starting now. Hail originally meant healthy and it was a word which when you met somebody you said hail, like hail Macbeth, hail Lord of Glams, meaning that you hope that the fellow was tolerably well. Because in lots of languages, if you are having a drink, you might say bon santé or salut or scone. And all those words mean what I told you was the actual original meaning of hail. Now, why don't we use words like that in English? I do not know. We all always survive. Uh, Peter Jones has challenged uh, Repetition of words. Yes, you use the word words before I'm assigned. <laughs> Derek? So, Peter, you have a couple <laughs> A correct challenge, you get a point for that, and there are 31 seconds on Hale starting now. Hale is one of my favourite towns in Cornwall. Not because it's particularly beautiful or attractive, but it is the penultimate urban area before you reach the coast in Mounts Bay. And there's an estuary, there are wading birds and dippers and mudlarks and all kinds of things as you sweep round this crescent-shaped, uh, wall. <laughs> <laughs> Derek Nimmo, oh. there was an error okay. there, so Derek, you have a correct challenge, another point, and six seconds on the hail starting now. The worst hailstorm that I ever saw was on the Laos border with Cambodia. I'd just come through the jungle, there'd been a tremendous thunderstorm the night before, and suddenly... <laughs> When uh, Ian Messiter, who sits beside me, blows his whistle, it tells us that 60 seconds is up, and whoever is speaking at that moment gains an extra point. And, of course, it was Derek Nimmo who has a lead at the end of the first round. Kenneth, the subject is finches. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Well, they're the passerine variety, and they also include canaries, buntings, and they have horn, which is very interesting, because only four... Seeds, but Finch's greatest success undoubtedly was in the Geoconda smile. I think Finch was better in that than anything else. They said Finch is best in Shakespeare. I didn't agree. William Franklin, I, I must question him about when Finch was in the Geoconda smile. Yes, I do. Was don't... that after Captain Cavallo? Yeah, I don't uh, think Peter before, Finch was in the uh, Geoconda no, smile. I'm thinking of that one that was at Wyndham's. I'm uh, talking you... about John Finch. You're thinking of the other <laughs> probably Peter Finch. <laughs> I don't about... think John Finch was born when the Geoconda smile was On the contrary, he did it in a revival at York. Oh. Very good he was, too. One I had them, the good fortune to go up there, days. apropos Barry Letts' invitation, and I was delighted to see it. Well, shall Letts I put that to the, the road audience road and say no, that John Finch played in the revival at York of, Finch, of uh, Geoconda smile? What are you so concerned about veracity for when you've so often said on this program they're allowed a certain amount of license? I've heard you do it. I know, but if you are deviating and Bill has. Oh, a of course, I forgot it. you're ill. Yes, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot yes. I'm not well, no, ill, I've just got a bit of a stuffed up head, that's all. <laughs> 
Uh, Bill Franklin, uh, would you take over the subject of finches with 33 seconds starting now? Uh, actors. <laughs> what? Hesitation, I'm yes, afraid. Yes, I'm afraid so. Sorry, I was breathing. I apologise. <laughs> it's very difficult. You have to breathe very rapidly in just a minute. You well, breathe for two all, seconds. not at all, actually, if you want to really be at home. <laughs> all right, Kenneth. Finches is back with you. 31 seconds starting now. Finches excited the attention of that very distinguished ornithologist, Ludwig Koch. And you know he spent night out in the gardens. During the emergency. Hesitation. I no, think so, of course yes. it wasn't hesitation. It was. You were going very slowly, too. Oh, uh, what rubbish. Oh, you were almost... Don't talk slowly. Ask this audience. Do I talk slowly? Yeah. Yeah. What's your mouth? How can they get me for being here? Of course they get me for nothing. That's Derek. why you get me for nothing. <laughs> you have the subject of Finch's 19 and a half seconds starting now. When I was at school, my prefects were called Finchers. There were two brothers. They were very nice guys. One became a canon of the Church of England and a parish in Wiltshire. Did awfully well. And I remember them teaching me my school motto, was ex hoc metallo. Uh, Peter Jones's challenge. Repetition of school. Yes, you talked about being at school and then you called I mean, that school motto. Yeah. Know. <laughs> Seven seconds for you, Peter, on Finch's starting now. It's a very good off license, and I can suggest that if you go there now and get some rum and mix it with a bit of lemon juice. <laughs> He didn't get time to add. He was suggesting good. the chairman should do that for his cold. Well, button. hurry up. Come on. Don't all this meandering you get indulging in. Why don't you get the thing moving? We don't want to hear all this rubbish about Marx. Who cares who earned what? No <laughs> rubbish. I know. It's what you contribute that's so important. Just holds everything up, doesn't it? But who some people do Marx like to hear. Before? They don't give a damn, do they? <laughs> they do. Some people. You're interested, aren't you? Yeah. There we are. Peter Jones is in the lead. He's two ahead of Derek Nimmo. And I'm William... in the lead. Yes. Oh. And William Franklin begins the next round. William, an odd orchestral instrument. Can you tell us something about one of those in just a minute, starting now? During the last war, certain musical programmes were used for sending messages to the underground operating in Europe. By the surreptitious orchestrating of the triangle, S-O-E, or for those who aren't conversant with its special operations executive and other similar outfits, they sent Morse-coded information covering the entire panoply of subterfuge operations. Working out a detailed and cipher communication to be transmitted on this odd musical instrument was very nearly as laborious and boring as this particular passage of ennui that I, we are now passing through. I'm more than delighted to repeat myself in order to be released from this earth-shattering and otherwise paralyzed... Peter Jones has challenged uh, you. Repetition. What of? What? I uh, practically everything. <laughs> Actually, he didn't repeat anything, but he did pause. He paused as well, yeah. That's just, that's just... <laughs> Your I thought that was a particularly vicious attack at the time when things were flowing. Yeah, like you know, the it's all right, Bill, I'm on your side. You didn't. I listened very carefully. You didn't repeat anything. You're on his side. <laughs> I agree. Yes, I disagree with your challenge. Oh, I mean, there must be on his side. Yeah, I suppose I'm does, not partisan yes. to anybody. I try to be fair yes, I all know. the time. Yeah, I go with... Labouring as you are under a severe cold, head cold, <laughs> I think you're doing terribly well. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bill, you did not repeat yourself. So uh, you have <laughs> 20 seconds to continue on an odd orchestral instrument starting now. Later on... Uh, Derek Nemo Chuck. What? Hesitation. That was a hesitation. What was? <laughs> you didn't say anything. You, you didn't say anything for two I seconds. I just started to and the buzzer went. <laughs> Does he <laughs> hear the buzzer before you press it? No, you've got to go. As soon as I say now, you've got to start. Derek Nemo has 19 seconds on an odd orchestral instrument starting now. I remember going to Corfu, an island which belonged to the Greek Republic, and there I went to the most extraordinary concert. A man called Papa Christo went out onto the stage with a tuba, which he hit with a clothes peg. And you've never heard anything... <laughs> So, Ian Messeter was laughing so much then he couldn't blow his whistle. But we got a little noise which told us that 60 seconds was up and Derek Nimmer was speaking at that moment, gained an extra point and he's gone ahead into the lead, won the head of Peter Jones. Bill... Fr <laughs> <laughs> William Franklin is in third place and Kenneth Williams in fourth. Uh, Derek, your turn to begin the subject, branches. 
Will you tell us something about those in just a minute, starting now? Branch, anything analogous to the limbs of a tree, and it can be used often for other outlets, say for stores. Companies like Woolworths have branches, or Freeman, Hardy and Willis, the Boots Company. Also, of course, and most memorably, the wonderful John Lewis Partnership. Selfridges, I believe, exists in other parts, have many different kinds of branches. And any of you think of British home, and I've repeated the other words, I won't do that one again, and Marks and Spencer starting up there in Leeds all those years ago, the Seafs, and now they've got branches, not only in this country, ladies and gentlemen, but even in Hong Kong. That's the kind of branches that this country needs, going out with the export drive to bring people back. What's the matter with you? Who's done that? Jones, why have you challenged? A repetition of country. I know, it was really full flood, oh, wasn't countries it? Countries and countries, quite different. I, I thought he said in this country. countries came to different countries. He did, you're quite he right, Derek. Yes, you're quite right, Sir Pete. I disagree with the challenge, and um, I think we'll only let you get away with that advertising because you did at least mention every store possible <laughs> you could think of. <laughs> there are 11 seconds on branches with you, Derek, starting a now. A branch is smaller than a bow and larger than a twig. And if you went out underneath the spreading oak tree... <laughs> so Derek Nimmo has increased his lead at the end of that round and Peter Jones takes the next round. Peter, the subject is the stain on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> it could be quite a nice one, Derek. Don't be like that. Uh, Peter, you have 60 seconds as usual, and you start now. What an extraordinary choice of subject for Ian Messiter to make and give to me to speak about. I can only suppose that he must have had a few drinks and <laughs> fallen perhaps face down on the carpet, and the result of this accident caused him to think of giving me... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Derek Nemo. Uh, yes, can right. quite agree, yes. Mm. So there are 21, sorry, 40 and a half seconds. The stain on the floor, Derek, starting now. It was 25 minutes past midnight when I went to the room and there on the floor was this sinister red stain. I picked up the telephone and dialed nine something similar three times. <laughs> and when I got a reply, the constable said, what is that? I said, there's a most terrible stain on the floor. Come down quickly. What's Kenneth that? Williams, charge. You see, when I got a reply, the transible said. Well, what's a transible? <laughs> transible? Is a, it's the name of the constable, you see. Oh, I know. He's Detective Sergeant Transible. Oh, I <laughs> What was that part you played? A transible or something? It's a transferred constable, actually. Yeah. <laughs> transible, very nice constable. one, actually. But it wasn't, it wasn't the constable Transible. No, it was the Transible, which is deviation from the English of constable. So, Kenneth, you have the subject. 35, 25 seconds, the stain on the floor starting now. I had a very nasty stain on the floor, <laughs> and I thought to myself, well, this is going to be quite a job in terms of eradication. But <laughs> luckily, I had the most wonderful remedy to hand. It's the stuff you use for deferring a kettle. Now, dampen a cloth. Shove a little bit on, and you will find not leaving it too long. <laughs> Worst cut of really so, in just a minute, we're not only informed and uh, entertained, but also we discover a great deal about the private lives of our four panelists. <laughs> Kenneth Williams has moved forward. He's now in third place alongside William Franklin. They're trailing behind Peter Jones and Derek Nimmo. And, Kenneth, you begin the next round. The subject is quasars. Will you tell us something about those in the game starting now? They emit the most extraordinarily powerful radio beams and light were first discovered about 35, it was, Cyril Hazard at the Astronomy Institute in Cambridge. I made the mistake of thinking that place in Massachusetts, but no, it is in the English county. And it led Professor Carbite to say that the star could give more illumination than South End. He said it made Blackpool illuminations look like a safety match rather than at work. Well, now, I thought to myself, when that occurred, well, there is 
an interesting piece of information because often only by comparison do we find out the real quality of anything. It's like hot only being possible because it's cold. <laughs> Well, this has happened more than once in this series of Just a Minute. Kenneth Williams begins with the subject and keeps going to the end without being interrupted. Mm. Magnificent achievement, Kenneth. No, it wasn't. Nobody else wanted the subject. <laughs> That's another thought, yes. But anyway, you kept going. You got a point for speaking as the whistle went and a bonus point for not being interrupted. And I'm fascinated to know what uh, Bill Franklin was writing all that time. You were writing a letter home or something. No, I was trying to work out some anagrams of quasars because I thought it was such a dull word in its present condition Mm. that there might be a more interesting variation amongst the anagrams. And I ended up with Sasqua, which is a Hindu tribal custom, which I won't elaborate on now. (laughs) I will say this, Bill, you are the most relaxed guest we've ever had on the show. I mean, anybody can do anagrams while the show's in progress. Well, only because I'm actually trying to keep up with it all and therefore by putting on this sort of Tony effect of being relaxed. I'm actually struggling through. My head is not above water as yet. The room has oh. gone very quiet. <laughs> it's actually, it's been fun to come along and actually see it all happening. It's rather like going to a, see a, an a operation, wing. you know, or a heart <laughs> transplant for the first and time. And that's what it comes across to you like, uh, just a minute, well, an operation. Like, yes, it's a sort of brain transplant on a newt, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, would you like to take the next subject? Yes, certainly. Right. Well, let's hear from you in the game now. The subject is When My Big End Went. When My Big End Went, it was a play that was being done, and there was a detective who didn't appear until the end of the first act. It was the first night. He was very nervous. It was an Agatha Christie. He waited in his Macintosh with his pulled-down snap-brim hat, and he paced up and down in his dressing room, made up, and he waited and waited until the time came. (laughs) He waited and waited. It was dramatic license to use the same word twice. I know, but you don't want to draw attention to it. You're quite right. Because he might have challenged on something else. They'll never know the ending. It's such a pity, because it's (laughs) impossible. I know, it's a very frustrating game as well, if you haven't... No, 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 I'll keep it for... Right, Peter, yes, your challenge? uh, Repetition. Yes, a waiting and nine... Very good to have spotted that. Mm. <laughs> 39 seconds, and Peter, on a boy too. when my big end went starting now. I'd like to hear more about what happened after he waited and waited. <laughs> <laughs> William Franklin yes. challenged. Yes. Say so, you shall. Say yes. you shall. <laughs> so, uh, Bill, you have 34 seconds on when my big end went starting now. The actor uh, playing <laughs> a detective. The Eric Demo challenge. Well, he didn't say anything again. He just sort of sits there. I know there, he doesn't. doesn't. What? Bill, we're going to give you. We're going. We're going to be generous what? and say when I say now, you must be. Oh, what's that buzz? Oh, your buzz. I'm. That's what I. Bill, <laughs> <laughs> you know what gets me every time? As you say, go. I pause I don't a second, actually, I and, say... and I think that's the buzzer to talk, and it's Derek over there. <laughs> right. You're a right Derek, aren't you? I think you're... I'll put you up above a building and lower you down. I, I think, Bill, you're Sorry. learning... I think you're learning the game as well as the others. You're being very crafty and clever now. Am I? Yes, you are. Because no. that's absolute rubbish. You've just wriggled out of it, but I am no, no, going to be I, it was quite honest and truthful, the whole thing. It can't be. You can see I'm vulnerable, can't you? <laughs> you have now 33 yeah, yeah. seconds. Sit there, but you like must begin when I say <laughs> now. I never say go, I say now. Are you ready? 33 seconds starting now. Um, this... <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth has just accepted a contract to do you. <laughs> After all that instruction. Oh, it was too long. <laughs> I mean, I think I know, but the audience enjoyed it so much, I'm going to allow you to keep the subject. <laughs> you have 31 seconds. The police How strong is this story? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's getting such a build-up, I'm yes, getting I know. worried. <laughs> when my big end went, Bill, starting now. The detective. <laughs> uh, I, maybe I've got slow hearing. <laughs> I get the word now, it forms in my head, and Derek has got his finger up that thing. No, it was Kenneth this time. I've come to the conclusion, Bill, that you're never going to get started, so... They may enjoy it, you see. It's got quite a... They have enjoyed it, but I don't know how long we can keep it up. So, 
I'm going to give it to Kenneth now because he buzzed them. And there are 30 seconds for Kenneth on when my big M went. <laughs> starting now. Now, we've come down Haverstock Hill. And, of course, prior to going on that particular route, we had Brendo the engine. And when it arrived... Peter Jones has challenged. Uh, repetition. Of uh, what? When. Well, yes, well, listen. Yes. Well, 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 listen. Well, listen. Uh, well, well, listen. Jolly good, Peter. Challenge. Right. So, uh, Peter, you have when my big end went, and there are 18 seconds starting now. He waited and waited, and then... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Very <laughs> yellow, yes. <laughs> well, repetition. This is getting ridiculous. <laughs> I know, but the audience are enjoying well, I it. I want him to What's the matter with him? I know you want Bill Franklin to have it. Has he been sniffing glue? <laughs> <What's that? laughs> He's got an advanced, one that's advanced on the rest of us. Ours are retarded. Derek's is at least a second ahead. No, no what no, he I does don't. is he so. keeps his buzzer in his hand all the time. He doesn't do what you do, Bill. He just put it down in front of you. He likes something in his hand all the time. <laughs> <laughs> now pick your buzzer up I and keep it there. It. Keep your finger on the nipple so we're all ready to go when <laughs> works right Derek you have a correct challenge 17 seconds when my big end went starting when now. my big end went they thought it was a rather odd orchestral instrument because it went <laughs> and everybody said what a very curious noise for a big end to make and I said well it's not actually because if you go outside in the average car park you will see big ends going that sort of noise all the time and William Franklin so going was repeated <laughs> yes you yeah, repeated right. going. Oh, God, no, it yes. was. Yes. <laughs> Desperation was creeping into his So head. Bill Franklin's learning the game. <laughs> and he's got him with one second to go. <laughs> so... <laughs> to see if he can start in one second because <laughs> these wicked fellows will give him no mercy the subject bill is when my big end went starting now the inspector <laughs> so William Franklin got a number of points in that round oh. and with the help of the chairman and also one for speaking as the whistle went he's still in third place but he's catching up on Peter Jones. He's ahead of Derek and Kenneth Williams, and they're all behind our leader, Derek Nimmo. Derek, it's your turn to begin. The subject is bugs. Will you tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now? I shall not be afraid of any bugs by night. It was from the Coverdale Bio, which was called, of course, the Bugs. And I didn't say the word before, B-I-B-L-E, because there was this most great creation, which should have been terror. But actually, of course, if you think about bugs, you know what my what? Peter Jones' challenge. Uh, repetition, of course. Yes, you did say of course before, Derek. I'm Absolutely, sorry. I'm not, I'm not Yes, so, Peter, you got in with the subject, and there are 42 seconds on bugs starting now. Well, a lot of people are unnecessarily afraid and fearful of bugs. The ordinary kind, I mean, that you find when you're camping, not the domesticated ones that frequent landladies' feather beds. Uh, <laughs> Kenneth Williams. It sounded like hesitation. I would agree with the hesitation, mm -hmm. Kenneth, so you have the subject of bugs and 30 seconds starting now. Bugs were found by Giles Brandreth in an hotel in the Soviet state of Estonia, and he said it was operating in the toilet and that Shanks had done the lavatory basin. <laughs> and he was quite amazed to find an English manufacturer had done the lavatory as opposed to a rough... Uh, William Franklin. Didn't he repeat lavatory? He did repeat lavatory. I didn't. No, I he said toilet, I'm I said sorry. toilet first time, you're great You should never have said uh, that in the first place. But that's <laughs> so he did really repeat lavatory... Uh, it was toilet, I remember now. Two seconds on bugs, Kenneth, starting now. Bugs in the bed can be red. <laughs> Kenneth Williams was then speaking as the whistle went, gained that extra point, and he's now only one point behind Peter Jones and only four points behind our leader, who is still Derek Nimmo. And the next subject is sensation. Peter, it's your turn to begin. Will you tell us something about sensation in just a minute, starting now? This is something that the press like to get hold of, and if they can't find a legitimate sensation, then they're apt to build some perfectly nondescript person or small event into a sensation, because they believe that people like uh, reading about them. So when somebody makes in prison a ghastly picture or something of that kind, 
They said... Yes, he hesitated. There are 35 seconds left for you to take over the subject of sensation, Kenneth, starting now. I had the most extraordinary sensation once in a cinema. <laughs> and this stuff started going down my leg. And I thought, that's funny. And I realised this chocolate ice cream was all going down, you see. Uh, William Franklin. Repetition of down. Yes, he did say down before. Bill, you are learning the game. Are you ready to start? Right. <laughs> There are 20 seconds. Sensation starting now. It is generally believed that the sensation of stroking a dog has a very therapeutic effect on mankind. And over the years, it's been proved that if you have a dog... I knew. Uh, <laughs> Derek Nimmo got in first. Of Repetition of dog. Nine seconds, Derek. Sensation starting now. I was in Bangkok, and it was the most wonderful sensation. I'd gone down Potpong Road and went to this rather curious establishment. Uh, William Frank. Repetition of went. No. Yes, he did. Yes, yes, he did say went. Yes. Um, oh, you've got one second. You are learning the game. <laughs> it's the last round. It's the um, last... Uh, um, subject, and there's one second for you to go on sensation starting now. Dog owners generally do not suffer. <laughs> well, as I said, this was the last round, so let me tell you that Peter Jones, Kenneth Williams, and William Franklin all finished equal in second place. What could be fairer? And they were only four points behind this week's winner, once again, Derek Nimmo. have enjoyed listening to this uh, edition of Just a Minute as much as we have enjoyed playing it and we'll want to tune in again same time next week when we take the air and we play this delightful game. Until then, from all of us here, goodbye. <laughs> chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messeter and produced by Pete Atkin. Kenneth Williams, Clement Freud, Peter Jones and Derek Nimmo in just a minute. And as the minute wolf fades away, to tell you all about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you, thank you very much. You're almost as warm and responsive as the audience we had a number of weeks ago. <laughs> Once again, it's my pleasure to introduce to you just a minute, and for those who've heard the game many times before, you will have recognized that we have our four regular players of the game. They've all been in just a minute since it first started, and we'll begin the show this week with Clement Freud. The subject is the intellectual members of our audience. Can you tell us something about that subject in just a minute, starting now? The intellectual members of our audience are sitting at the back, come from Cambridgeshire, and do joined up writing. <laughs> They're full of all sorts of bits of information, like they would know whether Nitz Knackers was smaller or larger than that. <laughs> they would know that Y equals MX plus C, and they'd be exceedingly knowledgeable on algebra and trigonometry. Many of them have passed A levels, some only going for O's, whereas a few get exceptional classes in their CSE and university entrance exams. <laughs> Hesitation. Hesitation, a full stop, but that is hesitation in the game, and uh, as you probably guessed at home or wherever you're listening, uh, we do have some followers of Clement Freud from Cambridgeshire who enjoyed his comments. There are 18 seconds for you, Peter, having got a point for a correct challenge, to take over the subject of the intellectual members of our audience starting now. I'm not at all sure that there are any intellectual members of our audience. I can only suppose that if there are, then they've wandered in here by mistake. <laughs> 
and they'll soon be swiftly making for the exit when they are horrified by the... <laughs> So, uh, uh, when uh, 60 seconds is up, uh, okay, uh, okay, I'm sorry. When 60 seconds is up, yes, Ian Messiter blows his whistle. Losing it, and he's going completely to beat it. I know. The effort of concentrating with the tremendous um, strength all the throughout. Right. Um, no, Ian Messiter blows his whistle when 60 seconds is up, and whoever is speaking at that moment gains an extra point, and it was, of course, Peter Jones, who is the only one to score in the first round, and we'd like you, Peter, to be... In the second round, the subject is taking the chair. After the intellectual members of our audience, would you tell us something on that subject starting now? Well, it's something that I would certainly hesitate to do because I believe it is occupied by somebody who, for his age, does a very good job. <laughs> he is our chairman. I suppose that would annoy some of the women's libbers. One should say chairperson. But in his case, I don't think it really matters because... <laughs> After all, it is a matter of opinion, largely, in his case. A certain epicene uh, quality. Uh, well, deviation, sex is not a matter of opinion. <laughs> People have certain obvious outward um, signs. I'm pointing no, out that his outward, outward signs are not very obvious. <laughs> I think this is one of those occasions when I will put it to the judgment of our audience. We've already established that they, well, we have some intellectual... Could you... To the audience, you know whether somebody's saying you don't, there's no outward signs of, of um, what the sex they've got. You, you know about that. I it's thought not. it might be fun to see what reaction we got from Could you stand up before you put it to the audience? <laughs> I'd even be prepared to strip off, but I don't think it's very good on radio, actually. <laughs> I let them judge. If you agree with uh, uh, Peter Jones and what he was saying about the, the chairman, then you, you boo for him. And if you agree with Kenneth, then you cheer for him and you all do it together now. <laughs> the boos ran out longer than the cheers. <laughs> By sheer sust sustaining of their noise, the cheers have it. So, Kenneth, you have a correct challenge. And you have 32 seconds on taking the chair starting now. Taking the chair was what I often saw in my father's barber shop when he would say, take the chair, next one, and a poor, rather effeminate creature said he fancied a blow wave and mild man. Get out of it! I've had a bishop in here ask him for a blonde rinse to match his mitre, but I'm not having none of it. Out of here, it's uh, right. Derek Nemo, just in repetition, out. Yes, out of here. He said it more than once. I'm not surprised after the things you've described, too. So Derek's got in cleverly with four seconds to go, taking the chair, starting now. A thick skin is a gift from God, and that can be said about Nicholas Parsons. <laughs> I disagree with both remarks. It's not a gift from God. <laughs> it's something you have to acquire in just a minute. And, and, and uh, anyway, Derek, you did speak as the whistle went. You gained an extra point, and you are now equal with Peter Jones in the lead, and you also begin the next round. And the subject is spoonerisms. Can you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Spoonerisms are something which was invented, or in fact, actually thought of, I suppose, by Dr. Spooner, who was dean of New College, Oxford, and then became warden of the same place. Actually, it's really rather sad because the poor man suffered from alopecia, do you know, and also was an albino, and couldn't <gasps> see very well. Uh, Peter Jones, a chap. That's not talking about uh, spoonerism. Yes, talking about spooner. He was talking about Spooner, he was talking about alopecia, and... Uh, I thought it was uh, jolly interesting, Derek, and I'm glad. I'm glad it was extremely talking. interesting, but if you Very want good. me to be dogmatic, I will be dogmatic. There are 38 seconds on Spoonerisms with you, Peter, starting now. Well, two examples of Spoonerisms are Neric Dimo and Ferment Cloyd. Peter, Derek Nemo Chuck. He couldn't manage a third one. <laughs> <laughs> so he 
hesitated. All right, Jerry, back with you. 31 seconds on Spoonerism starting now. Or, for instance, hush my brat instead of brush my hat. In the play that I'm in at the moment, I have to say, I want to go and paddle in the lily pond. And the other night, do you know what I nearly said? I can't possibly tell you because I transposed the word and it sounds absolutely disgusting and filthy. And Dr. Spoonerism wouldn't have liked my Spoonerism. And I have said his name twice. Yes, and nobody said it up till now. It's a bit slow. What? Uh, oh. Yes, but Clement Boy was grateful for the hint and he yes, challenged. Great. I thought he just might have said Dr. Spooner twice. I think you might be right, Clement, so I will give you the subject of nine seconds on Spoonerism starting now. Spoonerisms are called after Dr. Spooner, who was a New College Oxford and was an albino. <laughs> Clement Boyd was speaking, and when the whistle went, gained that extra point. He's once again equal in the lead with Derek Nimmo, and Kenneth Williams begins the next round. Kenneth, the subject this time is my personal evolution. Can you tell us something about that in 60 seconds? <laughs> starting now. Well, of course, a lot of honor, but I grew from infant ignorance into an extraordinarily mature adulthood where people are quite literally flabbergasted at not only the overwhelming nature of my intellectual persona and gift of natural diplomacy and tact, but they are also amazed that such erudition and that charm can, at the same time, be revealed, while other people uh, lack... Uh, Clement Freud's challenge. Modesty. <laughs> <laughs> so we give Clement a bonus point for his challenge, but uh, are you going to have another serious challenge? That's a serious challenge. Uh, <laughs> my challenge as well. But you've got no right. My natural evil. Well, all right, no, I mean, if that's all, I mean, we'll give you a bonus point for, your, for what you Don't say. Don't give him anything, Nicholas. No, no the audience no. nothing. But, Clement, okay, Ken, if we leave the subject with you, my Thank personal you. evolution, and there are ten seconds starting now. It includes the most dramatic development in what is known as my epiglottis and in the vocal cords. Well, there's <laughs> Then, what your epiglottis have got to do with your personal evolution? Well, you see, it is as an instrument a quite remarkable one. Now, I can go over what about three octaves? You couldn't do that, could you? No, of course you couldn't. And I can achieve sounds phonetically. You see, with my vocal range that do stagger. People are staggered. Perhaps you were born with that. I don't Kenny. call that evolution. Oh, Kenny, darling, they say. Because they're always trying to get round me and touch me up. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, Kenny, darling, they say. And then they... Do you know? And that's what you call evolution? Sorry, I've, I've forgotten the subject. <laughs> He was not talking on a subject then. He was answering a question of mine. He got a point for speaking as the whistle went. And Kenneth, you are in third place now. But only one behind Derek, two behind Clement, our leader. And Clement begins the next round. The Clement, you might remember a few weeks ago, when, of course, we had a different audience, um, a subject we had, one of the seven deadly sins. The subject this time, when we've got the four fellows back together, is a deadlier sin than the one Derek Nimmo talked about a few weeks back. 60 seconds on the subject, starting now. I think perhaps one of the deadliest sins is building a cattle grid without a ramp from which hedgehogs can get away. <laughs> the great problem is that these dear little animals fall into the... Um... <laughs> Very little challenge. Hesitation, but... Yes. 44... Yes, Jones, Jones wants to speak. Hmm. Jones, oh, no, I just wanted to tell uh, Clement that uh, should I ever... Uh, build a cattle grid, I'll certainly take all these precautions. <laughs> well, you have my word for that. They, yes, they're very, very useful in St. John's Wood. <laughs> <laughs> there are 44 seconds for you, Derek, on a deadlier sin than the one Derek Nimmo talked about a few weeks back, starting now. The deadliest sin of all is lust. I remember the first time that I saw Marilyn Monroe. I was reminded of the words, there is a broad who has got her future behind her. Because for me, 
She was in every way the kind of woman that I would like to ensnare and take back to a dirty wardrobe and have my way with her. Those blonde hairs, the long legs, the smooth thighs, the wrists, the arms, the cheeks, the lips, gleaming teeth. They were provoking in me the deadliest thing. Your uh, performance of Derek Nimmer has not only kept him going to I was the... disgusting myself. <laughs> yes, well, I'm, I'm really quite ashamed by I'm, the end. Well, very good audition for Bill Sykes, thank yeah. <laughs> The others are far too inhibited to charge you. They didn't see how far you would go. But you kept going. Whistle <laughs> went. And gained an extra point. You're now in the lead ahead of Clement Freud. And, of course... Uh, Kenneth Williams was next, and then Peter Jones, and Peter begins the next round. Peter, the subject is taking photographs. Can you tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now? Yes, I used to take them quite a lot. I remember I once took one of my small boy when he was almost drowning, and he was screaming and crying in the water, but I was so carried away because I thought it was such a wonderful shot that I <laughs> persevered with it, and indeed it was. Later on, when I was able to show it to him, he looked at it and with certain mixed feelings because it nearly cost him his life, this little snap. And uh, there he was. Uh, Ken, a bit of a, a, bit of a uh, Yeah, there. it was a hesitation. I'm just rather worried about the childhood that Peter Jones' family had. I mean, he's <laughs> drowning while he photographs him. And a number of weeks ago, his daughter had hiccups, and he had to pretend to have a heart attack. I know. I know. Well, I, your children all right, Peter? I did. I did overdo it. I, uh, for instance, I overdid telling them about electric fires and the danger of getting near an electric fire. And I did it so dramatically and effectively, they wouldn't go into a room where there was an electric fire. <laughs> That's too much, you see. It's definitely too much. And um, I think you're very oh. courageous to reveal these things. <laughs> Around the world. Well, I think uh, we should uh, alert the public to these dangers to hedgehogs, small think... children, and uh, all uh, living things, in fact. I think we should alert the general public to Peter Jones, then that's what we're doing. But Kenneth Williams had a correct challenge, and Kenneth, there are 32 seconds on taking photographs starting now. Well, of course, I've done this so often on holidays, and when you turn the album pages and look at the... Oh, that's one of our caves, and that's deck chair and chicken we got rather fond of. It's very nice to see Bill wearing a banana for a moustache. Oh, what a giggle we had. And everyone begins to get very nostalgic about the days when they actually had the courage of the <laughs> Kenneth Williams kept going to the whistle went, gained an extra point, others in the round, and he has leapt forward. He's now in second place, only one behind our leader, Derek Nimmo, and one ahead of Clement Freud, and Derek Nimmo begins the next round. The subject, Derek, is deal. Can you tell us something about that in the game starting now? Deal is a rather pleasant little place in, I believe, Kent. I think I'm probably right. Rather pebbly beach. I remember very nice castle, and of course... Hard by is the warmer lifeboat, with which have been saved many lives throughout the English Channel, where it tends to operate, because that is the stretch of water nearest to deal. But should you go there, please have a look at the castle. I think you will find... Uh, uh, Peter Jones, a uh, repetition of castle. If you mentioned the castle before, warmer castle, and now the castle. I thought the warmer lifeboat. No, warmer life. Well, yes, the castle. The oh, life castle. and castle, the same thing, aren't they? Yes, quite a castle. He's a don't... very intrepid traveller, really, considering he goes around the world all the time, and he only thinks that Deal is in Kent. Yeah. <laughs> it's very likely to be in Kent. Yes, well, that's it, you see. He gets on an aeroplane, he never sees anything of this country. Uh, 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 Pete... <laughs> Peter, you had a correct challenge, and there are 32 seconds for you to talk on the subject of deal starting now. Deal is to the pine tree what beef is to a cow. In other words, that's what it becomes when the timber is felled and cut up into pieces. 
and made into furniture of a usually inferior kind. It's a sort of... Uh, uh, Derek Nimmo, Yes, there was Derek, and there are 13 and a half seconds for you to take back the subject of deal starting now. A new deal for the American people. That is what President Roosevelt said in 1932, and he was absolutely right. And what he did from then on... Uh, Peter Jones, challenge. 1933. Two. <laughs> Shall we take a vote on it? Oh, I said 1932. You I can't know, take a vote on it. He said 30. I said 1932. No, you it's can't 1933. Take a vote on it. Peter heard about it. That's the point. <laughs> Then no. he'll have to wait a year before he makes the challenge. No, no, the thing is that uh, whether he made it publicly in 1933 doesn't really matter, because he could well have said it in 1932. I am not disagreeing with you, Derek Nemo. Please don't try and browbeat me and try and show me up in front of this marvellous, intellectual, yeah, intelligent, yeah, mar fantastic audience. Have I made my point? You still have the subject. You have five and a half seconds on deal starting now. Nicholas Parsons has every characteristic of a dog except loyalty. I've always <laughs> said a great deal. <laughs> After the things I've said, yes, Peter, what was your challenge? Uh, Whatever it is, you've got it. Thanks very much. Yes. Deviation and personal abuse. <laughs> I can't give you two points, but you have got one for deviation, and you have one second on the subject of deals starting now. It's cut up three. <laughs> so, uh, Peter and Derek Nimmer, Peter Jones and Derek Nimmer got points in that round. Uh, uh, Peter has uh, crept forward into third place and Derek's increased his lead and Kenneth Williams begins the next round. The subject, Kenneth, is Joseph Priestley. Will you tell us something about that great scientist in just a minute, starting now? He was one of those 18th century theologians who combined knowledge of religion... <laughs> Um, Derek Nimmer, chance. Well, deviation, because you said he had to talk about a great scientist. Now he's talking about a theologian. Well, he was a scientist and a theologian. Well, why don't you say that? <laughs> because we're not... You, we be don't know which one you're talking about, do we? If yeah, you say you, talk about a great I, scientist... I thought, I thought, actually, you were quite an intelligent chap, and you might have known that, you see. Well, you should have known better. <laughs> As the challenge, uh, with an in more like an interruption, he gets a point for that and continues, uh, Kenneth, on uh, Joseph Priestley, and there are 53 seconds starting now. A dissenting clergyman and consequently led up a lot of trouble for himself with the orthodox establishment and his partisan attitude apropos the French Revolution led an angry crowd in Birmingham to rush into his house, ransack and burn the contents whereupon he, who meanwhile has discovered oxygen and was very interested in changes, <laughs> removed himself to a place called Northumberland in Pennsylvania. Now it was appropriate with his views that he should have settled in a place like that. Uh, Clement Freud challenge. Reputation of place. Yes. They moved himself to a place and... Well, he doesn't know anything about it. He's only trying to get points. He doesn't know anything about it. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, he's got nothing to say about Joseph Priest. Do you what? But one of the things about just a minute is trying to get points, you see, Kenneth. Yeah. And there are six seconds for Clement on the subject starting now. Joseph Priest is a very rare name in Kathmandu. I dare say <laughs> you could go around the whole of Nepal looking... <laughs> Clement Freud, with that extra point, then move forward into second place. One behind Eric Nimmo, one ahead of Kenneth Williams, and three ahead of Peter Jones, and he also begins the next round. Clement, the subject is my forebears. Will you tell us something about those in just a minute, starting now? My forebears were called Desmond, <laughs> Montmorency, <laughs> Charles, and Fred. And they were hooked on Goldilocks and adored honey. In fact, they ate more of that sweet meat than any other bears that I've come across. My children, when they came home from work at night, used to say, will you tell us a story about your four bears? And I would sit down and say, once upon a time, there were four bears. They were called Charles, Sonia, 
Deirdre, it was a different story from the one that I was just saying before. And they adored it. In fact, some of them stopped, went on to the unemployment register simply so they could stay in the sitting room or lounge of the house and listen to other recantations of an animal nature such as this. The four bears that I had were a grandfather, mother, uncle... Tremendous effort and almost teetering on the brink of pausing, Clement Freud kept going and with great forbearance from the other three, he spoke for 60 seconds without being interrupted. He gets a point for speaking as the whistle went and a bonus point for not being interrupted and he's now in the lead just ahead of Derek Nimmo. Peter Jones, will you begin the next round? The subject is the binary system. Can you tell us something about that uh, in just a minute, starting now? Oh, Lord, well, it's to do. <laughs> yes, when you begin talking about the binary system with references to the deity, especially, my Lord, I think that is deviation, and I, I don't... Well, think I think... He we don't actually what you think. We're interested in the rules of the game, dear. Unfortunately, <laughs> Chairman, you have to be in oh, trouble, I think. <laughs> Because he'd only been going for one second and he still hadn't had a chance to establish whether he deviated from the subject. So, Kenneth, I disagree. The binary system with 59 seconds is still with you, Peter, starting now. Rutherford, as I was going to say, would have been able to talk about this at great length. It's a system that requires the use of two digits, usually, I think, one and zero. And I don't really know much more about it. <laughs> Deviation, that's not the binary system. But anyway, he was deviating. Yes, but he was deviating. I mean, it was, it was all deviation. The whole thing was, yes. 44 seconds, Kenneth, for you on the binary system, starting now. The binary system is the system of numbers whereby everyone is divisible by two. Consequently, 16 divisible by two makes eight. Uh, Daring member challenged. Two twos are four. Well, that is the binary system. I don't know you said two twice. twice. You, you said repeated the word two once. Well, I don't care. You discuss that subject without telling them. <laughs> that's what you have someone else do it, then I don't care. <laughs> that's what you have to try and do in just a minute or less. Well, you're going to say, you're going to say what it's about. That's what it's about. Yeah, yeah but if you're going to play just a minute, two. we've come to... It's about, isn't it? I think it's ridiculous, isn't it? Kenneth, we've... <laughs> Come here principally to play just a minute, as well as be entertaining. You're always entertaining, but we've got to keep at the rules of just a minute. So, uh, Derek has a correct challenge, and 34 seconds starting now. The binary system is the basis of modern computer technology. And wanting to know more about it, I wrote away to the Open University at Milton Keynes and asked them to send me various pamphlets and books about the binary system, which they most kindly did, free of charge. I was awfully delighted by it, and then started to watch BBC... Uh, Clement Freud challenge. Invitation. Yes, I would agree, Clement. So you have uh, 17 seconds to talk on the binary system starting now. In tertiary education, the binary system is the name given to universities and polytechnics and their varying claims to have a grant and educate children of that age in their own specific ways. I believe personally that it is right... <laughs> subjects on which to talk, but they all achieved something on, in that round, and it is also the last round in the show this week, alas. Uh, Clement Freud was speaking as the whistle went, gained an extra point, and he's edged forward. Let me give you the final score. It was a very close run thing. The four regulars, four most experienced players of the game, and they compete with tremendous panache and style and aggression on occasions, but they give us great value in between. Peter Jones finished in fourth place, just behind Kenneth Williams, just behind Derek Nimmo, who was only two points behind this week's winner, Clement Freud. <laughs> so we hope you've enjoyed the show this week and enjoyed hearing our four regulars pit their wits and verbal ingenuity against each other in such tremendous style. Until we all play just a minute again, I'll say goodbye from all of us here. Goodbye. Chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The program was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by Pete Atkins.